what has been presented so far has been categorized into five large groups by type. We have seen the nuragi and the great variability of shapes and sizes they present. We then moved on to the giant's graves, identifying two general types. We then looked at the holy wells, which present various forms, some roughly carved, others true masterpieces of precision. The Domus de Janus showed us a common design that manifests itself with varying degrees of complexity, from small caves with a single room to large caves with several rooms. Finally, we saw megalithic Sardinia with its menhirs and dolmens. We conclude this broad and in-depth overview of Sardinian archaeological sites with the presentation of some sites that do not fit into any of the categories presented so far. Near Oskiri, there is a granitic area where curiously eroded rocks can be found. Among them, there is a 10 meter long one that emerges from the ground and on which niches of different shapes have been carved. The so-called rock altar of Santo Stefano stands today in front of a church. The recesses are in the shape of triangles, squares and circles. Other smaller recesses are found in various places. Some niches are half a meter deep. The surrounding rocks have further recesses and are clearly carved with figures of circles, resembling cup marks, as well as other shapes. Among the granite boulders, which at times seem to be molded, we find also some Domus de Janus. The site is not dated due to the almost total lack of archaeological investigation. At a height of almost 1,000 meters, above the tree line, is the Megaron Temple of Domo de Orgia. The temple is surrounded by a sacred stone enclosure and is rectangular in shape. At approximately 22 meters long by 8 meters wide, it is the largest temple of this type in Sardinia. Made of schist, the walls are still around 3 meters high. The extension of the side walls creates a vestibule from which, through two imposing entrances with lintels, we can enter the two inner rooms. The walls project inwards. In the first room is a vertically placed stone slab. And here we have the second doorway leading into the smaller room. Più piccola. Probably, probably a kind of holy of holies. But I mean, truly a peculiar temple. We have not seen anything like it. Both entrances are narrower on the outside and wider on the inside. The site is dated to the Neuragic period, but several findings confirm that it was also used in later times. In total, there are about 15 Megaron temples in Sardinia. Of an entirely different type is the ziggurat of Monte d'Accoddi, the only one of its kind in the Mediterranean area. Pyramid shaped, it has a 42 meter long access ramp and is a total of 9 meters high. The 
the remains of other structures can still be found around the temple. The boulders are roughly assembled and those in the upper part are relatively small. Excavations have shown the presence of two altars, built at different times, the older one incorporated into the newer one. This is basically the wall of the first temple, from 3000 BC, which has been excavated but was originally covered by later work. In the vicinity of the temple, there is also a 4.5 meter high man here, weighing an estimated 5.7 tons, and a horizontally placed slab of rock, measuring approximately 3 meters by 3 meters, and weighing 8 tons. When struck, the slab resonates. Two spherical stones, one of quartzite and the other of limestone, were found in the surrounding fields and brought to the Tsigurat. During transport, the largest stone was broken. The site is officially dated to the pre neuragic period, with the oldest altar dating back to 4000 BC and the subsequent extension dating from between 2800 and 2400 BC. On top of a small plateau is the last site I present in this long review of Sardinian archaeological sites. The pre neuragic complex of Monte Baranta presents completely new features not yet seen in Sardinia. Upon reaching the plateau we immediately find stones of megalithic dimensions. A little further on, there is a wall almost 100 meters long, composed on the outer side of relatively well matched polygonal boulders. It is really different from the usual style we encounter here in Sardinia, in that it is clearly a polygonal wall, I would say of the second type. The boulders are roughly carved to match one another, then the spaces that remain have been filled with smaller stones. The wall has a narrow passage that leads to an area enclosed by the wall and a cliff, and in which some small structures still stand. The inner side of the wall is composed of much smaller stones. On this wall, too, we find megalithic boulders. The wall is still between 2 and 3 meters high and around 3 meters wide, filled with small pebbles. In front of the wall is a pavement that seems to be composed of huge slabs of rock and a large number of megalithic boulders that include lying men here several meters long. Boulders are clearly carved with large flat surfaces and right angles and are arranged in the shape of an egg. A few dozen meters from the wall is another very special monument. Composed of gigantic boulders, it is a U-shaped wall that overlooks the cliff and has two corridor entrances that run through the entire wall, up to 6.5 meters thick. Here is the second door. Also here we have a giant lintel. The corridor is always 4 or 5 meters long. This site is also officially believed to date back to pre neuragic cultures, erected between 2500 and 2200 BC. Again, one cannot help but notice that the older a site is believed to be, 
the larger the boulders that were used. As already mentioned, these last four sites cannot be categorized into any of the previously presented groups. Personally, I have not seen any other site with incisions and hollows similar to those of the rock altar of Santo Stefano. I have seen very few rectangular monuments. The Ziggurat is unique in the Mediterranean, as is the Monte Baranta complex in the Sardinian archaeological landscape. The only thing these four sites have in common with each other and with some of the sites previously presented, is their dating. According to official archaeology, they all date back to the pre-Neuragic period, to a time span of over 2000 years, from around 4000 BC to 2000 BC. Having reached the end of this long presentation of Sardinian archaeological sites, we can now try to reason and present some theories regarding their builders and their function, however, without claiming to be able to reach a definitive answer. According to official archaeology, the historiography of Sardinian monuments does not present any particular problem. Domus de Janas, Menhirs, Dolmens, the Proto Nuragi, the Giant's Graves, and the last four sites just presented date back to the pre Neuragic period, between 6000 and about 4000 years ago. This period is in turn subdivided into various cultures, such as the culture of Sucarropu, the culture of Filiestru, the culture of San Ciriaco, the culture of Arzachena, the culture of Ozieri, and the culture of Bonnanaro, to name but a few. The various monuments mentioned would fit within the work of one or more of these cultures. These would be followed by the Nuragic civilization around 1800 BC, with the erection of 8000 Nuragi and the construction of the Holy Wells. According to official archaeology, Domus de Janas, Dolmens and Giant's Graves would be funerary monuments. The Nuragi would essentially be fortresses with a military purpose, and Menhirs, Megaron temples, the Ziggurat the Monte Baranta complex and the Holy Wells would be monuments with a religious purpose. Little is found on the proto Nuragi. They are thought to be structures with a civil purpose and sometimes also with a defensive function. The question of the original use of these sites is not made any easier by the fact that, given their long history, over the centuries and millennia they have been reused by different peoples and civilizations for different purposes. As we have seen, even today some nuragi serve as a place of protection for livestock and storage of useful materials by shepherds. In his exemplary descriptions of the nuragi he visited, Della Marmora mentions difficulties in properly exploring a monument because of its reuse by farmers as a pigsty. In another case, he describes the ruins of a nuragi reused in Roman times as support for an aqueduct. Considering that the Nuraga was already in ruins at that time, we can get an idea of the great antiquity of these monuments. The analysis of some of the larger archaeological complexes allows us to make further observations. At the Nuragic sanctuary of Santa Vittoria, we find a proto Nuraga, some Nuragic style constructions, a holy well and other ruins with different styles of construction that would make the use of this site span at least 1000 years. In the Prano Muteddu archaeological complex we find menhirs, Damus de Janas and other structures of different types generally associated with tombs. Also in the archaeological area of the well of Santa Cristina we find the Nuraghe, other constructions similar to Nuraghe but elongated, some menhirs and the well itself showing a use that, if we consider the official dates reliable, has remained constant for thousands of years. Regarding the well of Santa Cristina, it should be added that there is also a church and a small village of relatively recent construction nearby. This is a novenary, a place where at certain times of the year people from different villages meet, historically for nine days, from which the name derives, 
to perform religious rituals that are now Christian. It is believed that in ancient times these gatherings were also intended to allow young people from different places to meet and thus mix the blood of the peoples that inhabited the island. If we use the official dating attributed to the Manius as a reference for the first use of the site, the neuragic sanctuary of Santa Cristina would have been used for sacred and religious purposes for over 4000 years. Similarly, in the archaeological complex of Tamuli, we have giant's graves, Betili, Anurage and the neuragic village showing a use that must have lasted for several centuries. Also at the town of Tarros are finds from different eras, from neuragic villages to Phoenician temples. The columns in this shot are not original, but date back to the 1950s. This fact still found today in important cities such as Jerusalem and Rome, where we also find monuments from many different eras and civilizations, shows that the sacredness of certain places transcends time and cultural and religious differences. Moreover, particularly in some of the sites presented, it seems to indicate that in the succession of different civilizations and religions, the new cult has often maintained and preserved at least part of what it inherited from the old cult. It is important to mention that over a thousand bronze statuettes have been found in Sardinia, depicting a little bit of everything, from men of various social classes, to animals, to gods, and objects of various kinds. Della Marmora gives an extensive review with detailed drawings of those he was able to see in 1830 at the museum in Cagliari and elsewhere. It is undeniable that some of these bronzes depict bizarre, sometimes almost disturbing beings. During the credit rolls I will show further depictions of Sardinian statuettes found in Della Marmora's book. They are officially dated to the Late Bronze Age, corresponding to the Neuragic Civilization, to which they are attributed. However, it is useful to know that bronze was already in use in Mesopotamia 1000 years earlier. They have been used to date some sites, but considering what we have seen and discussed so far regarding the reuse of monuments, I believe they cannot provide certainty in dating stone monuments. It is interesting to place the Sardinian phenomenon in a broader worldwide archaeological context. Menhirs can be found in France, Germany, Great Britain, Mongolia, Portugal, Scandinavia and other countries around the world. Even in Italy they are present in at least seven regions. Dolmens are found in Ireland, England, Portugal, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Scandinavia, India, Armenia, Syria, Crimea, Korea and Japan. They are also found in Italy in several regions. The Menga Dolmen in Spain is probably the largest in the world. 27 meters long and 6 meters wide, it is today covered by a mound and consists of 32 megaliths, the heaviest of which reach 180 tons. Structures that seem to be related to the Nuragi are found in Scotland under the name of Broch. The Talayots in the nearby Balearic Islands also bear some resemblance to Sardinia Nuragi, as do some complexes in Spain. Some types of trulli in Puglia have shapes reminiscent of the Nuragi. Further research will show the presence of Nuragi-like towers in other places in the world. We find some similarities between the giant graves and the Pedras Formosas of Portugal, whose apparent use, however, was to mark off access to steam baths. The bather would slip through the hole to enter the bath. There are those who believe, however, that this was a later use, and that they were originally tombstones. 
The dimensions are remarkable, up to 3 square meters for the largest ones. With regard to the Domus de Janus, we can only say that caves dug into the rock are a legacy present throughout the world since the beginning of time. These considerations show that the Sardinian phenomenon is not exclusive to Sardinia. What makes it unique on this island is the quantity of individual monuments still existing and the mixture of so many different types all together. The more one delves into the study of the vestiges found on this island, the more new questions arise, the answers to which are not obvious and keep alive a centuries-old scientific debate. I think it is useful, in conclusion, to provide an overview of other theories and explanations that have emerged over the years. According to the geopolymer theory put forward by French chemist Joseph Davidovitz, the ancients were aware of mixtures of minerals and soils that made it possible to create a kind of cement. Davidovitz claims that the Egyptian pyramids were built in this way. That the Romans were already aware of cement 2000 years ago is confirmed by one of the architecturally most important monument of their era. The Pantheon Dome in Rome, with its 44 meters of diameter, is still the largest concrete dome in the world today, 1900 years after its construction. In any case, the general impression I had of the Nuraghi and the other Sardinian monuments is that they were carved stones. It would be hard to explain the creation with geopolymers of the strange, tendentially rounded blocks that have often been used. I mention this theory, however, because in the Nurage Aidemuru we were able to observe, in the joints between the boulders, a filling material that appeared to be basalt but with shapes that made it appear smeared. Analysis of the composition of this material will help clarify whether it is real rock or a type of cement. Very controversial is the theory of the existence of giants. Over the years, dozens if not hundreds of testimonies have been collected from people claiming to have seen skeletons of giants during excavation campaigns in Sardinia. These were later taken away and hidden or destroyed by the authorities. I myself met a Sardinian who claimed to have seen very large skeletons. I took my Vespa, I came here, I found them there. They were emptying the sarcophagi that had never been touched. The original ones, made of stone. There were seven meter mummies and they were emptying them. It was all surrounded. I can't say who was there. There's no point anyway. Of course. But the authorities were there and they took everything. Where you stand, there was the head. One day, when it was raining a lot, I came without a shelter, without an umbrella, without anything. I had my lamps, a storm broke out. In the trees it was raining, there was nothing there yet, not a thing. Everything was clean. And I saw a nook here, I slipped inside and I saw the mummy there. It had its head here and its feet under that stone. Ah, underneath, so it was over 4 meters. 4 meters 24 because we measured it. Ah, okay. With my friend, we had measured it all. The teeth, the fingers, everything. On the internet, there are many articles about the discovery and destruction in America of thousands of skeletons of giants, as well as photographs of alleged finds. But in the age of digital information, it is difficult to verify what is true and what is not. I mention this theory for the sake of completeness to show that the debate is more heated than ever. We can only note that, while it is true that we have a type of find called the giant's grave, and that certainly the presence of giant man would make it easier to explain the use of large and heavy stones, we also know that the Nuragi often have a low entrance even for a modern man. As expected, it's too low for me corridors and staircases are very narrow. The giant's graves vary greatly in size and in general the presented structures seem to adapt relatively well to the size of a modern man, with the possible exclusion of the Domus de Janus, which often seem to have been made for even smaller men than the present Homo sapiens sapiens. In any case, 
Even if the Nuragi were not built by giants, this does not a priori exclude their possible presence on the island at some point in prehistoric times. Also much discussed is the discovery of the so-called Giants of Monte Prama, stone statues of warriors over two meters tall, whose origin is still hard to understand. After being forgotten in a warehouse for 30 years, they are finally on display in museums. As already mentioned, various studies, researches and treatises have been made over the years on the astronomical orientations found in many Sardinian monuments. Already Della Marmora systematically noted the orientation of the monuments he visited. This led several researchers to advance the hypothesis that certain nuraghi, for example, acted as clocks to determine the seasons of sowing, harvesting, etc. The hypothesis is certainly plausible, but does not justify the presence of 8,000 nuraghi. Another hypothesis to explain these alignments would lead us to consider them sacred or religious monuments. In this perspective, the possibility has also been proposed that they were places of physical, psychological and spiritual healing. As fanciful as this may seem today, reading Vitruvius's text De Architectura provides an interesting insight into construction criteria in the ancient world and specifically the Roman world of the 1st century BC. Vitruvius describes how the choice of location for the construction of a sanatorium or even an entire city had to be made on the basis of a careful analysis of the healthiness of the site according to strict topographical, geographical, astronomical and climatic criteria. A temple to Mars had to be built outside the city so as not to make its citizens belligerent, as well as one to Venus, so as not to stimulate fornication beyond measure. Vitruvius's treatise is written in a very rational and scientific manner, but it shows how, even among the Romans, concepts that today we would consider spiritual were considered authentic realities and given due consideration in architecture. This would point to a possible use of the Nuragi as religious places of healing and an explanation of the preferential astronomical orientation found in many Sardinian sites. Also much debated is the attribution of the mythical people of the Shardana to the ancient Nuragics. In the second millennium BC, the Egyptians mentioned a federation of peoples called the Sea Peoples who attacked Egypt and other regions in the Middle East. Little is known about the places of origin of these peoples, but according to some scholars, one of these peoples, called Shardana, came from Sardinia. The Egyptians also tell of how they later hired the Shardana as mercenaries. Many conical or pyramid-shaped hills can be found in Sardinia. According to some researchers, the island was the famous Atlantis as told by Plato. He recounts how Atlantis was located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, a geographical reference generally identified today with the Strait of Gibraltar. But some prestigious ancient Greek sources, including Aristotle, placed the columns in the strait between Sicily and Tunisia, that is, in the Strait of Sicily. More recent scholars have therefore re-evaluated this possibility and, after further research, concluded that Sardinia, being beyond the Strait of Sicily for a navigator coming from Greece, was Plato's Atlantis. This would later be hit by a powerful tsunami that would wipe out its civilization. What we have observed that would lend support to the idea of a tsunami is the fact that many nuragi are still today half buried by meters of earth, even if they are located on top of small hills where floodings can be ruled out. The nuraghe sunurashi was dug out of the mud, as old photographs show.
The same can be observed when comparing some nuraghi drawn by Della Marmora with what we can see today. Following the Atlantean hypothesis, the pyramidal and conical hills could be ancient pyramids covered by mud and more accurate inspections should be made to clarify the plausibility of this hypothesis. Identifying the builders of the Nuraghi with the Atlanteans would backdate the construction of these monuments by thousands of years. The questions raised by the Nuraghi and the other Sardinian monuments are more than the answer we can find to date. I have tried to present some of the possible explanations that have emerged over the last 200 years. Since there are few certainties, each hypothesis has the right to be exposed and evaluated. It will be then up to the individual viewer to judge which one seems more plausible. For my part, I limit myself to one final consideration. If it is true, as has been said, that the degree of development of a civilization depends on the degree of development of its mathematics, we must consider the people who made the Nuraghi and the other monuments on the island to be very advanced. We have seen astronomical alignments, geometrically flawless works, giant boulders, architectural marvels, which still resist the inevitable destructive action of time. Why thousands of tons of stone boulders were moved and set in place to create small, dark, cramped spaces that we would not know what to do with today will remain a headache that, I hope, will stimulate the curiosity of future generations, encouraging them to visit these places. This long walk through Sardinia has come to an end. The island has shown us unexpected and little-known treasures. In the future, more resources must be devoted to the valorization and study of these ancient monuments, which are still hesitant to fully reveal their secrets. I would like to remind you that the number of ancient structures on the island is more than 100 times greater than the number I have been able to present in this documentary. The possibility of visiting ancient vestiges, where few have set foot in recent centuries, is still a reality in Sardinia, and could lead to discoveries that shed new light on the mysteries surrounding these places. The search for stone riddles continues.